it was quite surreal. We're doing the counter-offensive of Ramadi. I'm sitting in this Saddam's throne, drinking a mango lassi and calling in bombs off aircraft in support of Iraqi special operations. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is in my family. We weren't out there to take country. We were out on your That was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where, you know, you're going to humans quite often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to you screw up. To War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. You should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, or what can you do for your country. The volunteer for service was, in effect, to put your life on the line. Troy Knight is a former JTAC a joint terminal attack controller. The JTACs are known as the Special Forces Unit of the Air Force, with Troy deploying alongside members of the Special Operations Task Group in combat in the Middle East. The Royal Australian Air Force veteran has deployed multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as doing private security work. Troy spoke to Thomas Kay in the Hornsby RSL Club. I'm Thomas Kay, and today I'm speaking with Troy Knight at Hornsby RSL. Troy, welcome to Life on the Line. Thanks very much, Thomas. Good to be here. Troy, tell us about your upbringing. Grew up in the north side of Brisbane, middle class family. Was pretty much given everything I needed, so I, I don't have any backstory there where you know I was mistreated or you know I was up against it from the get go. You know, just grew up like any sort of normal boy, you know, living on the on the coast, surfing and playing sort of rugby league, which is you know Queensland's sort of premier game up there. So. Yeah, normal childhood. I sort of, when I got to high school, I started uh, discovering a lot more of an adventurous streak. Figured out that school wasn't really for me, so I definitely took more time off school, disappearing than I was at school. Started push the boundaries with a lot of things. May have even come across the law once or twice, but I think that's fairly standard for most um, sort of red-blooded teenagers these days. Do you have any military ties in the family? Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was a World War II vet. I served up in Papua New Guinea with an engineer regiment up there. So I grew up listening to his stories. He used to basically, when I stayed there on the holidays, tell me stories of what they got up to in, in, in Papua New Guinea and, and fighting, obviously, the Japanese up there. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, he was pretty gruesome with some of the stories he told me. And it probably, was, <laughs> probably wasn't appropriate. I don't know if I'd repeat the same stories to, to my son. But yeah, that definitely sparked my interest in the military. And when did you know that that's what I want to do, I want to go join the army? At a very young age, I was, had set my sights and it sort of ebbed and flowed. And even going through high school, I was like, no, I'm just going to join, join the army. Because at, at that stage, that's what I wanted to join. I left high school and went straight into a butcher's apprenticeship because everyone said at that stage, because university like, was for the super smart people back then. And it's not like you needed a degree to get a job 20, 30 years ago. So I went straight into an apprenticeship as a butcher and completed that apprenticeship and at the time of completing the apprenticeship, Timor had just kicked off. And I was like, yep, yeah, I'm in. This is my chance. Rang up the recruiting office and uh, sent my recruiting packet in and started the process from there. When you started the process, did you know where you want to go? Or is it just kind of like, let's I, get in the door first? I was 100% wanting to go infantry. I wanted to be a rifleman in the Royal Australian uh, Infantry Regiment and go from there. I actually went through recruiting, got accepted to become a rifleman. But, and this was in late, late 99, they couldn't get me into recruit training till I think around August of 2000. It was at that time, uh, one of the recruiters there had said, have you heard about Airfield Defence Guard? And then sold me down the path of that. You know, Do you like camping? Do you like fishing? I was like, yeah. And he goes, oh, well, if you like infantry, you'll like this. We can get you in the door because of your GAS score. Um, it you know, was the equivalent. We can get you in the door and starting recruits in basically February of 2000. So I was just like... At the time, and then this is the real kicker that he sold it to me, he goes, Airfield Defence Guards are in Timor. They're looking after the, the airport at Dili. So that's the way he sold it to me, and I was like, you beauty. That gets me in the door, you know, six, seven months earlier. Uh, and then obviously, you know, there were stories coming across the news of the SAS getting into contacts, and so I had all this weird and wonderful, you know, ideas that I was going to go over there and see combat and fight this miraculous war against the, against the militia. Funnily enough, that didn't happen. Yeah, so I got accepted. I went down to recruit training in 2000. By the time I finished recruit training and then went on to ADG basic course, which is initial employment training, which teaches us our bush skills, our infantry minor tactics. The only rotation of FL Defence Guards got pulled home. 
So funnily enough, the Royal Australian Regiment, like the infantry guys, they kept going for years. <laughs> so if I'd stuck with that path, I would have got a trip to Timor. Instead, I missed out. But uh, that's the way it goes. You stayed in the role then. And then what happened next for yourself? Yeah, so I went through, obviously, an AG basic course. Uh, graduated on to, went into two airfield def- defence squadron uh, up at Ambly, where I ended up serving uh, for five years. I was lucky enough in that role to do uh, numerous deployments. I did uh, some boat people roles over there. We're escorting whether Royal Australian Navy had picked up boat people, I took them to detention centres and we just ferried them around from between sort of Cocos and Menace Island, yeah, numerous places where they had the uh, detention centres at times. So I did that. 2003, I deployed to Iraq as part of Operation Catalyst. We were providing security for the air traffic control detachment at the time. So they worked at a Baghdad International Airport and they pretty much took over. That was the first time I saw a US combat controller. So the Australian uh, air traffic controllers took over running that airport from the uh, American Special Operations uh, Combat Controllers there. Did a deployment there and then later on went to Bend Arche for the, the title way for humanitarian aid uh, disaster relief. In 2003, you completed the Military Police Closer Personal Protection course. What can you tell us about that? One of my most enjoyable courses I've ever done. That's where I learnt, obviously, the uh, skills of being a bodyguard. It was a six-week course at the time, uh, running out of uh, Sydney here, uh, with the, and it was run by the military police. And it holds a really good reputation uh, amongst all the uh, CPP courses with the military, especially the British one, which was supposed to be the premier one at the time. The Brits uh, really held the Australian CPP course in. Yeah, we basically got to cruise around and, um, and play the role of bodyguard, and we got taught how to be a bodyguard, got taught how to be part of a protective team, residential team, uh, and then do advanced team. Most of it is in civilian attire. So it was something quite good about shadowing, uh, you know, something very fun about being paid in the military to do a course and I'm shadowing, you know, my principal around uh, Sydney, but staying out of sight, getting to dress up in a suit or a nice clothes. The best part of the course though was the advanced driver training package that we did. So they as part of the course, there was a, like a seven-day package that they got. It was run out of a driving school uh, down in Canberra where we basically took our hire cars and pushed them to the absolute limits. So they had a skid pan there, taught us how to drive high speed in reverse. So we used to chase each other around the skid pan in reverse, you know, one starting at the 12 o'clock position, one starting at the 6, and they'd say go. And obviously the skid pan was all soaped up and you chase each other around in reverse. There was the high speed side of the course where they actually had a racetrack up the back and... They were clocking us times. They were teaching us how, techniques of high-speed cornering, rapid braking, to, and the teaching not so much also the driving side, but the mechanics behind it all. So learning about touching the brakes, which transfers the weight onto the front of the car, therefore gripping into those high-speed corners. And you're able to get an extra 10-plus kilometres an hour out of that. So, yeah, it was something quite good about being a, a 20-something-year-old male, and I got paid to drive a car at high speeds. And it wasn't my car, so I didn't have to worry about it. So that was a brilliant course, that one. What motivated you to take the course? Uh, Airfield Defence Guards are the only ones outside of the MPs that do it. And there was like a memorandum of understanding between the military police and the Airfield Defence Guard to do that. Because subsequently, uh, a lot of bodyguard work that gets done in the Air Force will get done by Airfield Defence Guards on one-star generals and above sort of thing. So I was lucky enough. Look, I wanted to do the bodyguard course because I'd heard all excellent stories about it and it was a physically and mentally tough course and then I wanted to push myself. And obviously it was very competitive. So they used to run and as a lot of servicemen and women can tell you, there's always pre-selections for pre-selections for a selection course. So 2 AFDS one it's ran its own pre-selection course, which went for a week and we pretty much got flogged that week. And then we went down and got flogged with fitness and everything else uh, down on the course for six weeks. So but it also gave me the background to, you know, for my later adventures when I went private security and then even executive protection later on. You then got your first deployment to Iraq. Uh, so we were on a military skills competition at the time down in Canungra. Basically, it was five days, I think, like four nights, five days of very little food and sleep and walking long distances to stands where um, when you get to these stands, you have to basically recall information you know, based off our job, so infantry minor tactics side of things. So things like why things are seen, judging distances, even little things like how to cam up the old Land Rover 110, and you get judged on that and scored on that appropriately. And then obviously uh, at the end of that, all the scores are added up and best section wins. So we just finished that. We just finished the Canungra OBS course, which again is one of the most brutal obstacle courses I've ever done. 
It's got these underwater tunnels, which uh, at the end where you've got to swim through with your gear. Water is freezing in Canungra all the time, just in the hinterland of Gold Coast, which is ironic because 40 k's away, you've got surface paradise, which is like the mecca of partying. And then you've got this you know, shithole Canungra with army warrantesses kicking around, just yelling at you all the time. So yeah, we just finished that. They announced the winner of it. Like I was in the recon sniper section at the time. We won that. Then the CEO comes over to us and goes, you know, hurry the fuck up, get your gear cleaned, get in the cars and get back to Amberley. And I was like, wow, what's going on here? You know, that wasn't very, you know, I was thinking, what's going on? We just won. Why is he so grumpy with us? And we're all joking around. Everyone's like, because Iraq had been kicking off then, but only the special forces guys had been deployed at that stage. And obviously they, I believe they were, they'd pushed forward the Hornets as well at that stage uh, to, to do a bit of bombing, a um, bit of deep strike. So all the boys are joking around carrying on I was, uh, thinking yeah what well, it's a deployment I personally thought I'd want a you know all expenses paid trip to the Wit Sundays or something like that but yeah we got back to Amberley obviously got into the briefing room and they said yep uh, you're going to Iraq so go home get your stuff together get back here tomorrow and it just happened like that we pushed up to up to Townsville did pre-deployment training and then jumped on a herc ride for about 36 hours so sitting on cargo netting for about 36 hours and it wasn't 36 hours straight obviously we had to refuel but I couldn't feel my ass for another week like that's how numb it was just from sitting on that cargo netting. Yeah, it pushed into Baghdad and went from there. So that's how that's how that's how we found out. And it just was a, just a rapid deployment like that. So provided a bit of security for the uh, air traffic control team that was running the airfield. What was it like when you first touched down in Iraq? It was surreal. It was surreal. So you could look out the windows because we come in on American Herc. You're looking at the windows and there was just still gunfire because they'd only just taken the airfield at the time, uh, I think. Outside of the headquarters staff, we were like the first conventional guys in there. Obviously, Special Forces had been in there for a while, Australian Special Forces. And that. You could see Tracy just going off in the sky, and the Americans were just throwing this C-130 around. My heart was in my mouth. I didn't know what to expect. And then, yeah, we touched down, and uh, so I, I can't remember. It was dark anyway, early hours of the morning. And then, yeah, we got off the plane, and were met by some Americans, and then obviously taken over to the air traffic control tower. How quickly did things kick off for you once you touched the ground? Straight away. Straight away. We started what we threw our gear down, provided a bit of security presence for the rest of the detachment there whilst they sort of got their head down and we started rotating through, basically just a picket around the area. But mind you, I mean, we were inside a secure compound. The Americans had secured the base pretty well by that stage. So the level of threat was a lot lower than, say, what it would have been a few weeks before that. Overall, what was your experience there like? Really good. I worked with... Uh, Excellent bunch of people, Australian was, um, met excellent bunch of, you know, coalition, both Americans and, and British. It was my first big deployment whilst doing, you know, a few boat people things beforehand. This was my first big deployment. So the only disappointing part for me was we were very protected. Being conventional forces, we were very protected by the government. So we weren't allowed outside the wire. We did go out for special occasions, but it had to be approved at a higher level. Like they didn't want us going out doing our normal job and actively seeking out, you know, the enemy to prevent threat, obviously, to hurt the guys we were protecting, the air traffic controllers. Is there any other stories that you can tell us from that first deployment? We had the CIA compound pretty close to us. We found their secret stash of beer. May have borrowed some of their cases of German beer and drunk that. So, yeah, there was that. And then we got mortared a couple of times. Like, that was the closest we came. So we ran our own, I mean, you couldn't do it these days, but we ran our own little bar on the rooftop called the Mortar Bar. It was two beers per person once a week. But it was a great way to unwind and relax. We were on top of that roof one night when, yeah, they decided to send in a salvo of rockets, which landed. I think the closest was probably 400 metres away, but it certainly, yeah, that was the first time I got rocketed. So it was an eye-opener for that. So then in 2004, you're deployed again, but this time in tsunami relief efforts as part of a RAF task force. What can you tell us about that? Boxing Day, obviously, the tsunami came through and wiped out a lot of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific from that earthquake. I was playing cricket with uh, my best mate at the time and, and having a few beers and watching the Boxing Day test and obviously in the, in the breaks going out and having a, a game of front yard cricket sort of thing on the, on the driveway. And we get a phone call from the boss and he's, um, he's like, you know, do you just want to deploy? We're going to, as a security attachment for uh, a RAF-led task force. I don't actually know if it was RAF-led, but it was obviously had army engineers in it. There were Navy personnel there as well. So it was a combined effort by all three services. And yeah, we pretty much packed up that day and I think we were up in Darwin by the 27th, and then we're over into Indonesia not long after that, where we stationed out of Medan, I think, which is the capital of the northern island of Sumatra, for a, another day, whilst the uh, advance party pushed in to have a look at Bandarche itself, and then we flew into Bandarche and worked out of the airport at the start there. All nations, as well as, obviously, um, civilian aid agencies, were just flying in so much aid. I've never seen anything like it. 
and just medical supplies, food, blankets, everything. So we were doing everything at the airport from helping. There was no security we had because the, the place was just devastated. I'd never seen devastation. Like in all, even all, all my deployments, my kinetic deployments after dropping bombs and everything, I, I've never seen the devastation Mother Nature just had then. So we were just helping unload aircraft, just helping out wherever we could on that one. And it wasn't until uh, for a couple of days after being in Ant Band Arche, we actually pushed in with the Army Engineer Team. The Army Engineer Team did a amazing job they basically was pumping water out of the one of the canal systems there and purifying it and then handing it out to the locals and they were, they were running this operation 24 7 and so we went and helped them as much as we could and then we um, cruised around they started putting up field hospitals like all the medics and the doctors and that started putting up field hospitals so we helped out in there as much as we could there were dead bodies littered everywhere they're upside down cars with whole families in them that were just dead and we're talking carnage four kilometers inland from where the ocean is so there was still devastation. There was a boat six kilometers, like a fishing trawl that was six kilometers inland from where the ocean was. Um, it, that tidal wave remapped the coastline. The absolute devastation that it caused was phenomenal. I witnessed some of the bravest things from the Archinese people. Some guy had pretty much gangrene fingers on one of his hand. And due to the medical supplies and the amount of injuries there, obviously the medical supplies were thin. So they were performing amputations. The Australian medical staff were performing amputations on people without anaesthetic any pain relief whatsoever. And I, I watched this elderly Archinese man get two or three of his fingers amputated without any anaesthetic, and he didn't even wince. Uh, it really was humbling to see what they went through, but they still kept positivity out of it, the Archinese. So. Sounds like a bit of a polar opposite in sort of your first deployment to your second and what you witnessed, what you did. And it is, and it still goes down as, don't get me wrong, I love the kinetic side, you know, the combat side, dropping the bombs, but it's probably my favourite deployment. I walked out of that one being so satisfied with the job. Like we, we achieved the mission. That deployment ended and then in 2005 you discharged and began work as a bodyguard security contractor. I started working for a British company looking after engineers basically and the engineers were in charge of rebuilding obviously the power stations and the water stations, all the infrastructure that they'd bombed out during the initial campaign. Part of a protective team for those guys. It was good. There was a lot more autonomy. And I liked it because I was actually doing the job that I was paid to do. I was outside the wire at the time too. It was starting 2005 and 2006, I think. Were like at the end of 2004, it started to pick up, but the IEDs were everywhere. So you really had to be on your game with your, your route planning, the way you drove, and obviously the protection for your clients. I felt it was a total different experience. So I got to see rather than just sort of sit inside where my 2003 deployment, I just sat pretty much inside the Baghdad International Airport. A couple of times I went into the green zone, but other than that, I didn't get to see the rest of Baghdad, where on this first contract was predominantly around Baghdad and a few areas just north of Baghdad, uh, and, and sorry, just south of Baghdad. I actually got to see a lot of areas because anywhere there was a power substation or a uh, like a water pump station that needed fixing, we would have to take the clients out there. So uh, it was pretty good. Did that contract, that was an American because the previous contract came to an end, so I went with an American company then and was providing protection again to EOD guys. So that they were responsible for going to all the bombed munition storage areas and blowing up any munition that hadn't been sort of blown up with the initial blasts, I suppose. So just that stopped the insurgents getting it. So that's because the insurgents wanted a lot of the explosive there, that contract actually was a lot more, a lot more intense. So we got blown up several times on that one. I was lucky enough that on the previous contract with the British company, I was in a vehicle, a vehicle IED then when we got blown up, but it was only a small one, So, and it was on the opposite side to me, so I was lucky there. But we got hit a lot of times on that American contract. Uh, significantly, the biggest one was a complex ambush uh, in a place called Nazaria, and they were very heavily um, Shia militia underneath the species of Mokhtar al-Sada, so they were very uh, militant. Yeah, so we got blown up pretty bad. I was like in the vehicle behind. Funnily enough, it was the vehicle that I normally drive, and for that one day I didn't drive it, we changed it up. And, yeah, killed the driver and wounded two of the others in the car. We pulled up and did our drills as trained, grabbed the guys out. As we're grabbing the guys out of the vehicle, we got uh, lit up from the other side of the canal, like from the side we're actually pulling the guys out from. The vehicle nearly drove into the canal because it killed the driver and it sort of just went off on its own. So, yeah, we're in a small little gunfight then as we're trying to sort of pull out two heavily wounded guys. That probably went on, that literally probably went for about 10 to 20 seconds. But it was, for me, it was, you know, the first time I'd been out in the open and been shot at. 
Luckily, I was concentrating on the wounded guys. The other guy providing protection, he sort of returned fire and suppressed the enemy. And by the time I got the guys out, they were sort of, we could see the insurgents on the other side of the canal line starting to run away. So I managed to return uh, a few rounds and being the, the terrible shot that I am, missed ob- obviously. So, and then obviously started to treat the wounded with you know, initial care. And l- luckily again for me, there was no extenuating bleeding. Whilst they had pretty bad injuries, None were life-threatening at that stage. And then the, uh, the team medic sort of got down and obviously started running fluids in and, and treating them accordingly. And then they got um, they got medivaced out by, I think, the Italians at the time. They were running that. So, yeah. So that that contract finished in uh, sort of end of 2006 where they changed companies. I didn't want to – I'd had enough of Iraq by that stage. Uh, it was good money, great adventures, and I met some awesome people and do not regret it one bit. But, yeah, that's where I sort of went into – I was lucky enough, again, through one of the contacts I made – and a lot of this contract work is, is was networking. It was like who you knew. And if you could prove yourself, then word of mouth would get around and say, hey, look, he's he's a solid guy. Uh, put him on your team. So, yeah, I was lucky enough to be offered a job doing anti-piracy work out of Singapore. So I spent about three months in and out of Singapore going up the Malacca Straits, just doing anti-piracy work, basically in a couple of follow ships. And now, um, bear in mind, I know nothing about sailing a ship or, you know, not that I'm sailing, but I knew nothing about it. Luckily, we had... There was two Kiwi, there was one ex-Australian guy that I used to work with uh, who got me the job. There was a couple of ex-Kiwi SAS guys uh, and there was a couple of British Royal Marines on there. And they taught me everything I needed to know about it. So it was, it was pretty good. So I just sat on a chase boat the whole time and, yeah, we were escorting um, a company by the name of uh, Daewoo, which everyone would have heard of. They were doing uh, oil, they were exploring for oil up off uh, Burma, or sorry, Myanmar, I think it's called now. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. But uh, yeah, off off there. So they were doing setting up an exploration rig in the ocean. So we were just escorting uh, the ships up, which were basically building that rig. So yeah, so I did that over the Christmas period of sort of 2006 and early 2007. Uh, that was definitely interesting, and, and it was great working in a Singapore. That place is beautiful. Now your time in the military wasn't quite done. How did you hear about the raising of a RAF special operations unit? Yeah, so I, after the uh, Singapore stuff, I took a, a job as a security manager in Indonesia. I was basically living in Jakarta and flying out of Jakarta to uh, their tin mines, basically looking after tin and gold mines with my Indonesian counterpart, just providing security training and security plans to all these mine sites. During that time out, I was still a reservist, not that I was parading too many days at all, but I spoke to uh, one of the guys I used to be, he was one of my bosses when I was a uh, AFL Defence Guard, just chatting to him, and he's told me about it. He said, oh, look, we're raising this um, unit, which is Joint Terminal Attack Controllers, and they're gonna, it's a specialised Air Force unit, and we're going to be working purely with Army Special Forces. You know, the intent was to commando. He's like, where are you at in your contract world? And I went, oh. I said, look, I'm on a contract, 12-month contract at the moment. I said, but if something happens, then I'd definitely be interested. So he sent me an email, and he's like, yep, this is the intent. This is what's happening. The smelting company that I was working for had a hostile takeover by an Indonesian company because they were a Malaysian company. So got rid of all the, they cut all the, I suppose, the dead wood. And I was looked at as, because uh, I was a foreigner, I was looked at as dead wood. So, and it, I was obviously getting paid probably just as much as the executives were anyway. So they, yeah, pretty much terminated my contract, uh, which they could do legally anyway. So yeah, I came back home to Australia, sent an email out and paraded for the first time at RAF-based Townsville as, as a reservist. And the first time I paraded, I put in my application straight away. So it goes to, I think I had to, it had to get signed off by the, the reserve squadron EXO. And he's, he's looking at me, he's like, who the hell are you? And what is this RAF special tactics that you're talking about? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm sure I've been here before. And uh, he's like, oh, okay. And he's like, what's this? So I explained to him what it was. Um, reached out to my old boss who was part of the pr- uh, program then. And I think he, he was just about to go on selection. He just finished selection by that stage. It was very late in 2007. And he sort of explained to him uh, what it was. And he was like, yep, no worries. So I did a couple of days reserve time uh, just teaching weapons handling and running ranges for the reserve squadron in Townsville. And then I got accepted into the special tactics program uh, January 2008. So they flew me down to Newcastle. And then I think it was about August 2008, I did commando selection course because uh, at the time, or well, still is at the time, we do the commando selection course and we do the full commando reinforcement training. And then we go on to do another six months of air training after that where we learn to be JTACs, learn how to run an airfield and survey an airfield. Can you tell us some of the extra details that go into that? 
Last bit of training. JTAC being the Joint Terminal Attack Controller. I think it's a six-week course now. It was only about four weeks, I think, when I did it. But like everything, creeping excellence comes in and it's always got to add extra pieces in. So that's the job where you talk to the aircraft and you deconflict air to surface fire. So basically I'm talking to a, either a manned or an unmanned aircraft and I'm coordinating the release of a bomb or a missile or some cannon fire being basically you know, big bullets in support of ground troops that are uh, either in contact or can't get to the enemy at that time. And then the, the survey piece is we can survey a piece of dirt basically to land an aircraft anywhere in the world called global access these days and then we run the airfield as well so we do a limited uh, air traffic control package for um, military aircraft so not obviously up to the same standard as you know an air traffic controller in the air force or a civilian one but we can still run that airfield and provide them with you know basically safety of flight and make sure that ground that they land on is good to go so that's the extra bit of three courses that we do and that sort of takes anywhere between sort of six to seven months uh, post obviously doing commando reinforcement cycle. What made you want to go through all of this? The Air Force side of things, I like the Air Force side of things, the way the Air Force was run at the time, that extra spatial awareness, that extra extra stress and mental pressure it has from, it's not just deconflicting the bomb off the rails of the aircraft and not dropping it on your own friendly troops. It's I still get to do the, the shooter stuff, like I still get to shoot people, shoot at people. Obviously not the same as you know, a guy from SASR or 2 Commando, but it's also not flying two aircraft together or not dropping a bomb off an aircraft onto another aircraft. So there's that whole spatial awareness side adds a whole different pressure to it. That's what enticed me. I did nearly transfer over to 2 Commando at one stage. I come back to off my, because I was qualified to their sort of lowest level. I come back off my first trip and there was a few things. Air Force were a bit slow in starting up um, a lot of our pay and structure and actual rank system and everything like that because these things take time but I was just getting frustrated with it so yeah I was pretty close to I had my paperwork in I actually pulled my paperwork at the last minute because funnily enough Air Force came to the party and got everything signed off and it's not as simple as that either like there's the whole government side of things legislative side that needs to be signed off when you when you create a new job like we did we basically reversed engineer it in we did the job and then the infrastructure and the career progression and, and the pay came afterwards where Probably should have went the other way around. Benefit of hindsight, I suppose, and the benefit of uh, maturity. But yeah, I was pretty close to changing over at one stage. And I believe you you got familiar in your role with um, one of the other veterans we've interviewed on the podcast, H. Yeah, H was my first CSM. So we obviously, four squadron combat controllers work predominantly out of Williamtown in Newcastle. That's where they, they're based. But they work with obviously two commando and now subsequently they've got guys over in Perth as well doing teams like that. So exactly the way, what we've done is we've mirrored what the US have done with their combat controllers when they work with um, Delta Force or, or CAG it's called or um, SEAL Team 6 or you know, Dev Group. So we farm our combat controllers out to, depending whether they want the global access team, so they want like a whole survey package to go or there's just that, the JTAC uh, specific role. So yeah, I went down to 2 Commando in 2010 in preparation for my first rotation, SOTG Task Force 66. And yeah, I was attached to H's company. He was my first CSM. So then you found yourself with two more deployments to Afghanistan, so 2010, and then back again in 2012. What can you tell us about those deployments? So I work with the same company for both those rotations. So I knew the guys quite well. And I pretty much stayed attached to them through 2011 as well. And then 2012, and then uh, post 20, even in 2013, I was still working with them. So Because I built up that rapport. They knew me, I knew them. 2010 was an eye-opener. I think H talks about it on this podcast where he actually, our first big job, it was my first big job, obviously, with the Special Operations Task Group. I had only dropped bombs in training at that stage, done a lot of work up with the guys, and the first big job we went on was into, like, southern Afghanistan. And H was the first person. Like, gets off, he's in command, uh, sorry, company HQ, and he was the first person to get into a contact. And, yeah, and it's just like, I remember hearing it over the radio going, why is the command, so, oh, what's the correction, why is the um, CSM? In tick, like, you know, CHQ are supposed to be further out of it than what I am. So, but yeah, so he was the first one and I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure he doesn't, I'm pretty sure he lets everyone still know that he was the first person to get rounds off on uh, on that rotation. That was an eye-opener of a job. We ended up, we're supposed to be in there for like 24 to 36 hours. So when you go on jobs, especially for myself as a JTAC, I had the old style radio so, and batteries. So I was carrying a lot of weight with body armor and that as well. And I was fairly inexperienced with the role. So I was taking extra stuff because I didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't know. 
So I was carrying a lot of weight. You hydrate up as much as you can, you eat up as much as you can, and then you pretty much starve and go without water for the, the whole, well, not without, but minimum water. So you end up coming back a little bit leaner and then pretty dehydrated, but to the point of, you know, you can still function. Now, we weren't in there for, I don't know, we're supposed to be in there for 24, 36, I can't really remember. But we were, it was an area that hadn't been accessed by anyone for about six years. And I think the Dutch had an outpost in there. Anyway, intelligence was saying that there was uh, like an arrest and recuperation or R&R place or for the Taliban. And there was a lot of sort of senior Taliban officials in there, obviously recuperating. So they said, yeah, go in there and find out what you can find out. Just basically a clearance mission. And yeah, we went in there. And that first night, obviously, you know, H got some rounds off. And I was just like, is this? And I was saying to the, the boys, I was in an Overwatch team with uh, basically a heavy weapons team. We re-rolled one of the teams with heavy weapons. And I was in an Overwatch position with them. I said, you know, whispering to them, is this normal? And they're like, oh, not really. Anyway, the first day, like, yeah, we're in tick. Troops in contact. So one of the teams is troops in contact. So it's on. Not us up on the hill. We were fine. Um, but the guys down in, the, in what we call the green belt where they're doing the clearance. So, yeah, that was, uh, you yeah, know, not a massive skirmish from what I remember. Um, the boys rolled up a couple of Taliban right there. Obviously did the clearance on them. Um, provided a lot of intelligence. So throughout that first day, uh, there was a lot of sort of small skirmishes where the Taliban were coming in because they hadn't seen anyone for a while, I don't think, uh, in that area. So they were coming in sort of hitting us with small skirmishes. And when I say small, probably 10 to 20 minutes at most, you know, periods of uh, shooting and then it'd stop and then periods of shooting again. Yeah, and having a bit bit to do. So that first day sort of rolls out and I think we're supposed to extract that first night. We got a phone call back from our high headquarters at Tarrant Cout, well, the bosses do. Word filters down, look, they're getting a lot of intelligence out of the area and you're stirring up a hornet's nest can you stay in there we said yeah cool we'll push it in there for another 24 that's what they wanted anyway, the next day rolls around the taliban are getting more gamer they're bigger size forces anyway they rolled up one of the um, smaller teams that we had and they the team had to break contact so this was sort of the first bombs that were about to go down and yeah the teams uh, the team's screaming on that look we need cas we need cas so myself and another jtac are trying to work he's working the jet up and I'm trying to find where the friendly position is because you can't sort of drop bombs. We've got to do what we call battle tracking. So throughout the whole mission, and you know, no matter what mission are, because you can have as many as sort of 16 different teams. In a bigger job, you could have disjointed sort of effort in there and you could have 16 teams on the ground and you're trying to battle track every time of them. So what I mean by battle track is know exactly what position, what grid they are on the ground or what compound they're in. Trying to find the team. Obviously, the team's fighting for their life at this stage. So their radio communication isn't a priority for them. We finally get their grid. The other JTAC had already worked up the jet, had the jet set. So we just finalised that we'd deconflicted, obviously, the bomb with all the other call signs in there. And it was the other JTACs. He was clearing hot the, the jet. So um, we were comfortable with it all. It was all, obviously, within rules of engagement. And, yeah, the jet uh, dropped the bomb, obviously, and the contact ceased. And they ended up sort of rolling up, I think, around sort of 8 to 10 Taliban over that stage. So And that was like a – they were up against like a, a four-man team. So, and they got caught by surprise. So that bomb allowed the team to regain the initiative, obviously um, achieve the ground force commander's intent. So that was my first experience. Now that wasn't my drop. Like I didn't pass any of the coordinates to the jet and I didn't do what we say cleared hot, which is the final approval authority for that jet to release the bomb. They can't release the bomb unless we say the words cleared hot. So that happened uh, in the morning. Um, a few other little skirmishes, which we didn't need close air support happened in the afternoon. Later in the afternoon, another team got hit up from a hill which was about 500 metres away from me. Now I could, through my uh, laser agent finders, so my binoculars which tells tell me the range, I could see the firing position and the team were getting pinned down pretty hard. So we called some close air support on to neutralise the enemy. Because it was closest to me, I had the highest situational awareness of the event happening at the time, uh, the jet was mine. So, yep, uh, so I think American Hornets, F-18s at that stage, briefed it up and said, yep, well, you know, I'd like a 500 pounder onto the area. I knew the grid because I'd sort of silently marked a lot of high ground. And by silently marking, I was already sort of plucking grids out off my map prior to any event. So I had a rough idea where it was. So I dropped onto, rather than sort of try and talk the jet on and spend time, because it's really hard to talk a jet on uh, to a target in Afghanistan in the hills, because all the hills look the same. And what I mean by talk on is putting his eyes and his, he's got a little pod on his aircraft, which has basically a camera on it, and he can zoom in, you know, a million times basically and, and see an enemy threat from you know, 20,000 20, plus feet. So rather than spend time doing that, I just like uh, calling in a piece of artillery, I just put it onto a grid. There was little to no threat of fratricide at the time due to the distance the teams were away and it was of high urgency because they believed it was a heavier calibre weapon up there, like a 
something like a 23 mil or something like that uh, firing from the hills. So knowing that, and you can't just wheel those things around willy-nilly than to sit in the back of trucks or in, they're in a fixed position. So that's why I just sort of went, you know, time is of the essence here. I'll just put it onto the coordinate. And I threw it in. I was pretty nervous at the time. It was my first drop in theatre. And it was closer, a lot closer than what I was led to do here in Australia training-wise for a 500-pound um, high-explosive weapon. So, yep, come in, cleared the jet hot, weapon off the rails, impacted. And it, the bomb breaks in half and goes what we call low order. So I watched the, the HE, the explosive in the... So I watched the bomb actually break in half and roll down the hill. And I watched the explosive burn out on the inside, like the, the hot HE. So I later found out that's called going low order. That's uh, where, yeah, something, it was either an old bomb or it didn't detonate correctly or something like that. So I'm like, great. First drop in theatre and I can't even get a high explosive weapon off. Yep. So I called in immediate rear attack, same weapon system, same target. Drops in again. Guess what's happened? The second bomb goes low order as well. So I'm cursing. By this stage, the bombs must have landed pretty close. Because the weapon, obviously the Taliban stopped firing on the guys. But this one, same thing. I didn't see this one break in half. It just went, I just saw a thud of dust and there was no explosion. So I'm just like, you are kidding me. I finally get to do my job. I've been in, you know, I'm helping the boys that are in tick and both of those bombs don't blow up. So needless to say, there's always good sense of humour. You know, it's not strict protocols, obviously, in the SF world. So I'm getting ribbed left, right and centre. So the boys have just been in, in... in tick and being, you know, fighting, hiding in cover. This is the team that was in contact, and I'm just getting ribbed over the over the over the net, you know, over the over the radio. So they're just giving it to me, and they're like, "You're useless, you raffy so and so." And it still goes on to this day. Like when I meet up with the guys, if we have a barbecue or something like that, they're like, "Remember that first drop you had where your first two bombs were no good?" So yeah. Anyway, word comes down. Funnily enough, that was late afternoon. Uh, word comes down that they would like us to stay in again. We said, "Yep, yeah, well, we're going to need resupply though." So they they organised the resupply again. Yes, yeah, so we get food and water brought in, extra ammunition, and that was cool. The third day, a dust storm came in, and it went through the, the next night. So we couldn't get extracted that night. So there were small skirmishes in the dust storm. I don't think we dropped any ordnance off aircraft because it was, they call it air red, so they can't even put the unmanned um, aircraft up as well because they just can't see anything. And it's safety of flight for, obviously, the manned aircraft. So, yeah, the fourth day come along, it cleared up a little bit, and funnily enough, that same position, firing on. So the boys had sort of pushed further I think it was north at the time and they were clearing compounds and stuff like that. But this site, and it was a decent mountain too from where we were. So if the guys contemplated, I know the boss contemplated sending a team up there to clear it, but it was would have been without sort of air support or anything like that. They were basically climbing up a cliff face. Anyway, the boys had pushed a bit further north on uh, day four and they, yeah, they got troops in contact from that same position. And it was into an open compound this stage. So they had a protection of the compound, but they were pretty much pressed up hard against one of the walls so the fire couldn't get them. But the fire was actually hitting um, the Afghani, co- you know, what they call koalas, which is their compounds. It was taking chunks off that. Um, so it must have been decent calibre. So anyway, I called for some, cl- rang up, called for some close air support. I had all the targeting data, knew exactly where the boys were, so it was pretty quick. Um, unbeknownst to me, the controlling agency who looks after all the aircraft in Afghanistan at the time sent me a B-1 bomber. So this is a strategic level bomber, I think capable of dropping nukes, but it's got loaded up with about 3,500 pounders, so many 2,000 pounders, it's not funny. Like it's, it's not exactly a close air support weapon, but it's got a lot of... So I went, yep, beauty. I thought, I'm going to make it sure this time. So they can do various patterns with their bombs. So I said, can I, do, can I get three 500 pounders onto this area and onto that grid and then put them in a, you know, the pattern which would give me the best chance of obviously uh, neutralising the enemy? B1 crew, excellent. Yep, pass all the data. They ran out for their run, heading running. Now, these things aren't like a jet that can just turn pretty quick. So they're running in from miles and miles. So they've given me the call that they're on their way in, and I'm going cleared hot. Anyway, it seems like minutes go by while this thing's running in on its heading, and then they go, yep, weapons away. And I'm just like, finger, like I'm sitting here with fingers crossed going, please. Anyway, it was the sweetest drop I've ever probably, you know, one of the sweetest drops I've ever had. There were three 500 pounders impacted all around that mountainside. Um, obviously, you know, uh, destroying the, the Taliban position there. So we never got any more fire from that position uh, at all for the rest of the trip. So yeah, I think that, that was day four. Funnily enough, that storm, dust storm kicked back up. We couldn't get out the night of day four. So by this stage, there'd been nonstop skirmishes going in with everyone's low on radio batteries, everyone's low on food and water. And we had to stay in that fourth night. So it, 
anyway, we're extracting. They said, yep, American Air Assault guys, so the uh, American Helo support that was supporting us for that operation, had said, no matter what, we're getting you guys out. And this was the level of dedication that a lot of the American support units, which we relied on, they're just like, nah, your coalition, we're going to pull you out. Uh, they were based out of Tarancop with us. They said, no matter what the air is, we're going to pull you out. We got through to that next morning. And mind you, by this stage, we're down to like, couple of magazines per man like i'd already because i hadn't been in anything i'd redistributed all my ma- ammunition and just got left with one because you know i'm not on the forefront of the, a lot of the gunfights anyway but i was down to very minimal radio batteries the guys the team guys are in radio batteries we had no i think we were drinking water out of a afghani well without sort of you know without using any purification means as well so i don't think we had any food uh, so we're trying to avoid gunfights at that stage so anyway we, uh, we got word yep coming in so we moved off to the extraction lz out in the dash Luckily, didn't get uh, ticked up on the way out, but we're all sort of cowering in the in the rocks, like trying to hide, like little uh, you know little school kids dodging the bully. But um, yeah, so it was my job to to mark the LZ. So I I, uh, I talked to obviously the helicopters as well, and and run the LZ in the landing zone for where they run. Uh, just prior to that, they'd given us a pair of A10, so the premier close air support platform of choice, because that's all, pretty much all they train in. So, yep, I um, gave them a bit of carte blanche. There's a certain type of controls that I can do where, because they're, they're FAC A, so they do my job but from the from the sky. So not only do they fly the plane, they can deconflict their fires in support and legally drop bombs in support of uh, those ground troops. So, yeah, th- they were just giving me heads-up calls, situational awareness calls when they're about to engage stuff. They're engaging targets as these Chinooks coming in. So normally you mark the LZ with some type of, like, a marker panel, like I'll be out there with a marker panel or we'll just throw smoke. Due to the situation, uh, chatting it over the boss, he didn't want, he didn't want to use smoke. He didn't want to attract too much attention. So he's like, "Yeah, but you just go out in the open. It'll be all right for you to go out in the open with a marker panel." So you got this meter by meter fluoro orange you know, VS seventeen panel. So anyway, it's dusty, right? So, so these two CH forty sevens, the Chinooks come in uh, to pick us up. This was just on our LZ. There was multiple LZs around the place, and I'm holding the marker panel up, and the first helicopter looks like it's going to land on me. I'm like. I wonder if he see me. So I'm like shaking it around and shaking it around. Anyway, he goes over the top of me just, and I, as I'm scurrying out of the way, mind you, I'm out in the middle of the open, scurrying out of the way, and the second one does look like it's going to land on me. But the downwash from two CH-47s that were pretty close absolutely ragdolled me. So mind you, I'm carrying, so with my radio, my armour, uh, even though I didn't have much ammunition, my, uh, my weapon, I was still probably carrying upwards of 50 kilos worth of gear on me. So it's ragdolled me, and it's blown me across the landing zone. So I got knocked out on the landing zone. So I was supposed to get on to the first helicopter with the boss um, and everyone else. Anyway, everyone's just legging it towards the helicopters. People are counting off, people are counting off. The helos, because there was shooting going on, they got, they got shot up coming in because the way they sort of ingressed over, over, they pretty much ingressed over the target. So they got shot up coming in. So they were in a hurry to get out as well. So before, I was supposed to get on the first helo. I'd been blown over, knocked out unconscious. The first helo powers up, so uh, the guy in charge of doing the counting, he's running up to the pilots going, no, 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 but the first helo just powers up and takes off. He's like, I haven't got my full quota of men yet. So he's telling, he's screaming at them, I come to, so I was only out of probably for about 10, 20 seconds, enough for the guys to get on. I come to, the ramp's up on the second helo, and I can hear it powering up. And I knew that was the second helo from where it came in. So I'm running towards it, and there, there's video footage of me running in and, and the boys sort of did a little cameo, you know, took the piss out of me and put chariots of fire over at the top of it. And, you know, the ramp goes up and ramp goes down and then I come running out into this dust storm and into the helo. But um, luckily they got word back to the second helo, wait and pick me up. I mean, that was just the level of coordination. That was, you know, that was brilliant. It was just, if I didn't have a switched on guy, he's a good mate of mine who looked after me that trip, or, you know, kept, took me under his wing, made sure nothing happened to me. But if I didn't have him there, so Em, if you listen, thanks very much, buddy. He sort of radioed through and made sure that second helo didn't enough. So yeah, I come in. And then got on the helo, took off, and then we got back. And then the loadmasters and the flight engineers, or whatever they call them in the US, are checking out the helo. And the front helo, I don't think uh, our one, the second one that I was in, took hits, but the first one took hits. Like, you know, there was bullet holes in it and stuff like that. So, yeah, they were pretty pretty lucky in that one. I remember getting back, having a shower. We sort of did a hot wash straight away, like a debrief. You know, went through the mission, made sure you know, what we could you know, improve or you know, sustain or what we need to or what we did well. And I remember taking that time to sit back and I, it was the first time I relaxed and I sort of went and grabbed a feed because the mess up there on, the, uh, on Task Force 66 on you know, Camp Russell there was brilliant. No matter what time you come back from mission, whether it be you know the commandos or SASR, they would always have that mess open so they'd always have a feed and, and they'd have hot food ready for you. So I remember sitting down and relaxing for the first time in that, in that five days and just going, 
what the fuck have I got myself in for here? I wanted adventure. I wanted combat. That's five days of absolute just getting my ass handed to me. What was, and I, you know, it was great. You know, I was on a high from it because I got to drop bombs. I got to do my job. Um, but I just went, and I said to the boys who had obviously done previous rotations, I said, is this like every mission? And they're like, no, nah, we've never done anything like this either. Did anyone see you get ragdolled? Don't think so. Because as the 47s come in and it's all dusty uh, out there, I think I just disappeared in the clouds of dust. And I don't think, like chatting to the pilots, they said they saw a day glow mark at one stage and then they didn't see it, like the VS-17. So I don't, like they didn't mean to land on me, but when they're in that final phase of the landing, like the final, what we call finals, they don't have, like unless they power up and go do a go around, they don't have, like you can't just sit there and just rip it down, especially with the bigger helos. So yeah, the boys, I don't think saw me get ragdolled. I'm sure if I if they did, they would still be laughing at it to this day, like me cartwheeling across the landing zone. So, had any of your time between service helped in preparation for what you faced? A little bit in the confidence factor side of things, knowing that I'd been into a little, a few little situations, being a private contractor, and I'd been able to deal with it quite well. Like I hadn't freaked out. There's a saying that goes around that, uh, and this came from the Americans that I work with. I was lucky enough on my second contract that I work with a lot of ex-American special operations guys. And they had this saying, all your training means nothing until you can do it under the pressure of combat. Until that first round flies down, you could be best shot, best jumping out of planes, the best driver, whatever. But until you do that under the pressures of combat, doesn't really mean a lot. Whilst I hadn't seen really a full-on combat, I'd been shot at for you know 10 to 20 seconds and been blown up. I still had that confidence that I was able to you know, be able to handle myself. And look, back then, uh, as any of the boys will attest to, I was a bit of a, a cocky fuck. So there's, it was borderline between confidence and cockiness, and I think I overstepped that several times. So that definitely helped out. But the training that I got, and that, this is what sunk in after that first trip, it was like, now I understand why we do a selection course because of the food and sleep deprivation side. Now I understand why we got pushed so hard on reinforcement cycle you know, throughout our, our courses and stuff like that. Because you get put in those situations. And, and you know, for me being a RAFU and one of the first RAFUs to deploy uh, with the Special Operations Task Group, there was a massive amount of pressure, you know, hey, don't stuff this up. That was self uh, self-applied pressure as well as obviously pressure from, you know, guys who went over before us as well. They did such a good job that they started increasing the amount of combat controllers. It went from sort of one combat controller for the whole FE to, I think in my rotation, we ended up taking three combat controllers over just purely because what the guys did before us. How did the rest of your trips outside the wire go? On that rotation, pretty good. There was another close call I had where we were chasing an IED maker and on extraction, we missed him. He got away and we were extracting out of there. We got into a little bit of a contact and I got shot through the map pocket. So I had a round go through my the leg of my pants, basically, and missed my leg. Just hit my map pocket of map. And I didn't really know what happened. I pulled out my map because I was I had uh, some unmanned... Um, I had an unmanned aircraft on, basically, and I'd forgotten all about chatting to chatting to him whilst I was, uh, you know, because I, I was returning fire in that one, so I was lucky enough to actually, sh- sh- I shot at someone, missed, again, because I'm a terrible shot, but um, yeah, I forgot all about talking to this aircraft, and then a voice popped up in my ear, I was like, oh, that's right, I've got an aircraft on, but yeah, I pulled out my map just to, you know, get a bit of situational awareness where we exactly were, I looked at my GPS, looked at where the enemy compounds were, and sort of um, put their, their eyes over, uh, their sensors over the area. And I've just got this hole from the map. And then I looked down at my map pocket and there's a hole through the corner of that as well. So it didn't make sense. And then I you know, I sp- chatted to a few of the senior guys and they looked at the way it went, the way it went through my map pocket. And they're like, that's a bullet hole, dude. I've, s- I've had one through and they're going, I've had one through my pack. And the guy's going, I've had one through my hat. And he goes, that's the way it tears through fabric and that hole through there. So it sort of creased the air end of it because your maps fold out, folds over. Anyway. So that was, yeah, that one. But yeah, again, the rest of that trip up and down in just with regards to hitting targets and stuff like that, you can go on target all day or you, I could be on target for, you know, we did a few extended sort of jobs where we were on there for a few days and you, you don't even see anything and you don't find anything. Well, then, you know, you go on one where you don't think anything's going to happen. So yeah, I had fun and it was a good bunch of dudes. So, so after your, de- your deployments, you have said previously that you helped develop further RAF combat control capabilities. A good mate of mine wrote up a massive paper uh, thesis which helps stand up the survey capability. So I helped uh, along with that, like I was one of the first guys to go through the survey course and we sort of 
developed it along the way. And then another good mate uh, developed our little sort of pseudo air traffic control package. And I was one of the first guys to go through that. So whilst I didn't develop those packages and I certainly didn't, and I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder, they did the hard work in getting it off the ground because there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of buckets of money you need to tap into or find to get uh, the training established. But I was just lucky enough to be either, you know, as part of the first course or the second course to do that. So I ended up later on becoming what we call a green team, which is our training our training team. So I was in charge of training all the junior, like I was in charge of screening, uh, I'd go down on commando selection and be a directing staff down there, uh, primarily looking after, uh, not looking after, but assessing our candidates and then putting them through their blue sort of training package. So I was lucky enough to obviously have that experience behind me in being one of the first guys to do the survey and the um, air traffic control stuff. So I was able to actually assist in uh, the application of the training for the new guys. You then found yourself heading back to Iraq. How did this differ from your first deployment? It was a much more rewarding one than, than uh, the first one. Just again, because I still got to do the JTAC role my actual role that I was put into, I was the what they call the SOF LNO, the so Special Operations Forces uh, LNO. So the mission was advise assist, and it was a different side of things that the the coalition were taking. They wanted the Iraqis to fight their own fight rather than the coalition go outside the wire and and kill uh, the, what we call the Daesh, which is you know everyone here in Australia I think knows them as ISIS, but we call them Daesh for that side of things. So we were advising the Iraqi uh, Special Operations Forces at the time. Now they had an English-speaking JTAC who had trained in America, and he's still a good mate of mine. He was a good JTAC. Yeah, we sat in what we call a strike cell. So uh, picture a room with just 20 TVs, and they're just getting all uh, video feeds from unmanned aircraft, so you know, drones from fast jets out there and just feeding it back into this, this strike cell. And the strike cell was made up of multiple JTACs, the soft LNO, which was myself, uh, even though I doubled up as a role as a JTAC. They had a strike director who, who you know, orchestrated the show, was like the maestro, I suppose. An American, you know, what they call JAG, so a legal officer, uh, judge advocate general, I think they're called. So basically, yeah, a lawyer to make sure that the, the drops are all legal, so in accordance with uh, laws of armed conflict and obviously rules of engagement. Targeting guys there, which would refine the targets for us, pull up better grids and imagery for us if we need to. So it was a totally different JTAC role completely for me. And it was kind of surreal at the start. So when we talk on the radio to the teams, like it's all encrypted. So it's got code in the radio so people can't hear it. So when we were advising the Iraqis, we couldn't give them our codes because they weren't part of the coalition. So we're like, how are we going to do this? So what we ended up getting was mobile phones. We ended up running like an app called Viber. And so the Iraqi JTAC, this is how surreal it got at one stage. I was sitting in the strike cell. I've got my Viber phone, which is totally unclassed. It's just like normal here. He's taking a photo of the building that he's taking fire from. And in the photo, you can see the muzzle flash coming out. And you can see the barrel of the weapon coming out. And then he's put it into, I don't know, whatever he does. And he's written on there, bring the booms here. And he puts an arrow to the window. And because he's English, obviously, he was pretty good, but he didn't, you know, he used to call them booms, B double O M. He'd say, "Bring the booms here," and then he'd uh, put the grid with it. So we'd put the aircraft onto that grid, and funnily enough, yeah, you know, there's muzzle flash coming out of the window, and you can, and the aircraft's positively identifying uh, Daesh in there. So obviously, you step through the rules of engagement. The lawyer gives the approval. JTAC works it up, and we're dropping bombs. So for me, on my rotation. I was there, like the uh, Iraqi special operations guys were looking after Ramadi at the time. They lost Ramadi and then they did a counteroffensive and got it back. So it was quite unique and it made me pinch myself that I was sitting there. I'd just gotten a mango lassie from the coffee shop down at the – because the American bases don't do things by halves. So, you know, there's a a green beans coffee shop. There's all these other coffee shops. So I've got a mango lassie and a coffee. So the soft LNOs, there was myself, uh, two Navy SEALs and an American combat controller. And we all – part of different task force that were advised assisting uh, Amer- uh, sorry, Iraqi special operations guys. So we all had different special operations units. So we were there to, we're all JTACs, so we, we all doubled up on the JTAC role as well. So we managed to, in our travels, find one of Saddam's old palaces. He had this big golden sort of, it was like a throne. Uh, and it was just packed up in the corner, like there was a heap of rubbish there. No one was in this uh, sort of palace. And this was inside the green zone at the time uh, in the centre of, uh, of Baghdad. So this thing was heavy. It took all of us, and it took us about an hour to travel you know, a couple hundred metres with it. So we're just shuffling, like four of us are shuffling with it. Anyway, we managed to drag it into the strike cell and we put it as the soft LNO desk, like the chair. So everyone else is just in normal chairs and that, and we've just got this big golden throne. And the Navy SEALs, like anyone who knows anything about Navy SEALs, they are the biggest smart asses you've ever known. Like they're, It's the whole long hair, don't care attitude, and they just run their mouth the whole time. I thought it was hilarious. So, you know, I just, it 
they took the heat for everything and uh, we were just behind there. So it was quite surreal. We're doing the counter-offensive of Ramadi. I'm sitting in this sedan throne drinking a mango lassie and calling in bombs off aircraft in support of Iraqi special operations. And I, I thought to myself, like, it was frustrating because I would have preferred to be outside the wire, but I'm just sitting there going, you know what? And at the same time, sipping on my, you know, my espresso shot as well. And I'm just sitting there going, this isn't a bad way to fight a war. I could get used to this. And then I'd go off after doing an eight-hour shift and uh, go hit the gym and stuff like that and, and watch, you know, movies. So it actually was a, it was a totally different deployment than what I was used to. It was, it was satisfying in a different way. I learned a lot about weaponeering side of things. Whilst I didn't get to see combat, like my first two rotations of Afghanistan, I learned a lot about the JTAC role uh, in a different respect of how hard it was to battle track a foreign force who was on your side through basically unclass means and then drop bombs in support of them, but then totally different weaponeering than what we used to use on the compounds or in the in the hills of Afghanistan because these were decently built structures, a lot of them. So, yeah, I learned a lot about how to blow up a lot of different buildings. So it's pretty good. Following that deployment, you were posted to the RAF Survival School as an instructor. Yeah, so I got promoted. I picked up my flight sergeants, which in Army terms is equivalent of a Warren Officer Class 2, although they'll tell you that it's not the equivalent, but it is. Nothing like a bit of friendly uh, service banter. But, um, yeah, so I had to take a posting. And it also worked out for me because I'd gone through a marriage breakdown uh, separation and my ex-wife went back home to her hometown of Cairns with the children, which we sort of discussed would have been the easiest option at the time just for support for her and I was still chasing deployments. I was still actively involved in the military. So uh, I went up there to Townsville, which is yeah, roughly four hours away from Cairns, so it allowed me access to the, the kids quite easily. Um, but yeah, I went to the survival school. Like all combat controls, we go through combat survival or SEER. Survive, evade, resist and escape. But yeah, spent two years up there learning permissive survival, so basically bush skills, learning how to survive if an aircraft or if I got stuck in environments such as jungle, arid, being the desert, or a sea coast or, you know, on the, on the water side of things. So it goes into a lot more depth of, and you have your priorities of survival, you know, it goes into a lot more depth than just, hey, I need food, because that's what everyone wants, so it's just where do I get food from? But if you don't have that warmth in your shelter, your body's going to go down. So they say, you know, rule of threes, you know, through hypothermia or, or heat, you can pretty much only last for, for three hours. So that's why you need sort of shelter or warmth. Three days, realistically, for, for water, and then three weeks, can pretty much last without food. They teach you that, so there's a lot more to that permissive side. But they also, the big one they go through, which is what helped us, is the non-permissive side. So it's when you're in operations. It's going through, you know, evading, like how to evade the enemy, how to hide, how to call in. Like there's certain procedures that are in place for both air crew and, and special forces when they're behind the lines. They're obviously at, the, at a higher classification level, so I can't sort of go much into them, but the special procedures. So you go through and you practice all those. Yeah, overall, yeah, good posting. I wanted to get back to Four Squadron pretty quickly myself and get involved there. So I was trying to get an option of a third. It was it was mixed feelings because I wanted to stay up there for the children. I got to see them and I enjoyed the posting. But I also wanted to get back into the mix of being a combat controller. So I got posted back to Four Squadron 2020. So sort of end of 2019, 2020, come back to Newcastle. I went to Four Squadron in a different capacity again altogether. The Bravo, so the senior NCO in charge of the flights there, which was basically looking after the JTAC course, looking after all the, the training for the new combat controllers. And then later that year, you tied up your time with the military. Yes, pretty much. So what happened, I suppose the years, it took their toll on me mentally and physically. So I've got physical injuries at the moment. Like I broke my back parachuting, compression fracture at one of my T-series which gives me a lot of pain. Uh, diagnosed with arthritis at the moment. I started suffering depression. Subsequently got diagnosed as uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. There's motion, you know, emotional roller coaster up and down. One minute I can be happy as Larry. Next minute I'll just be crying over nothing. A lot of anger. And I did what, every, what a lot of uh, military personnel do. I treated it with alcohol, which obviously amplified the problem. Went and saw a psychologist back in 2017. Had a, a bit of an incident misdemeanor there. And the boss said, look, you're not right. And my ex-wife had been telling me that the whole time, but I knew better, so I didn't bother listening to them. And then funnily enough, I had a, an incident, a physical altercation with another guy and got recommended to go see a doctor on base. That was the eye-opener for me. I was like, hey, I do have a problem here. Like, you know, I'm drinking excessively. I am angry all the time. I just want to fight people. And then, one, and then I'll be so sad and I don't know why. I went from sleeping easily eight hours a night to I'd barely sleep for, you know, three to four days. I think the longest I've been is, you know, I think nearly four days without sleep. So, yeah, and it's just the mind goes. It just races a million miles an hour and then you wake up in sweats after having a, a, a bad dream and stuff like that. So it's not your typical, I suppose, what you see in the movies. 
And that's why I didn't understand it. And I refused to believe I had a problem. So yeah, I went and saw a psychologist, a clinical psychologist. Uh, still see her to this day. She, It's good. To, I've built that rapport with her and I actually listen to her and have that third party side of things. So yeah, so that went on and on. And then, yeah, it was finally, so three years of doing that, of fighting it and you know, saying I don't have an issue. And then finally one day I just went, I do have an issue. I've got to admit that. Because the psychologist had been slipping it in every now and again. Yeah, you know, she wouldn't just ram it down my throat. She knew better than that. She's an excellent psychologist. Again, once I had finally admitted it to myself, it was it was like a weight had lifted. In my own eyes, there was a stigma. And I feel pretty ashamed of it because I've seen guys go through it. And I remember saying to myself, or even just saying to guys, I'm like, weak fucks, why don't you just grip it up? And it's not to, and, I, and I've had the same, not the same thing, but like I've, I've chatted to friends and they're like, what, what, what's happened to this aggressive Troy that's just in your face, and, you know? And um, I just said, yeah, you got Troy Mark II at the moment. Um, and when I explain to them everything, they just look at you and they don't understand. And I understand that completely because that's what I went through. And it's not something you can just grip it up. And, and then it's coming to the realisation that, hey, I've got this for the rest of my life. And it's that taking each day as it comes. And I, I still have bad days. Um, I'm getting on top of it. But, yeah, and then yeah, one of the key things is obviously don't abuse the substances. So... You go from there and then you, st- you still have your bad days, but it's acknowledging having those bad days. And that was a big frustration for me. It's like, so when I'm, when I'm good, I'm good. I'm flying, I'm the ultra oil, I'm multitasking. I'm thinking that what now, what next, what if? And I'm always at, you know, two steps ahead, you know, very calculated, very measured. But when I'm not, I'm flat out leaving the house. You know, and anxiety kicks in and, and it's like, why? And I don't understand, like, there is no reason. Like, I don't have any issues with anything I've done. But some part of my brain has an issue. So whether it's, the, it's, it's more so the subconscious side, there's something buried away there that I don't know about and that it's sort of seen and pushed away and compartmentalised. The psychologist, I'm not going to attempt to explain it because I'll stuff it up. But the psychologist goes into it, well, dumbs it down for me anyway, you know, draws stick figures and, and brains and, and arrows going everywhere and, and tells me the way the brain works. And, and your brain basically doing the high end uh, adrenaline rush stuff that we do is it remaps your brain the way the your, your grey and the white matter work. And then you don't, make those decisions with your frontal cortex or your frontal lobe which is you know, the normal thinking side which makes the common sense decisions you end up making it with the the center part of your uh, brain i'm not even going to try and pronounce that which is used for your uh, fight flight or freeze which is what we used to do in combat all the time but even just running through you're know, running through the house doing some cqb drills down at two commando or jumping out of planes at you know commercial airliner heights it just changes the way your brain works so it's not necessarily and that's what they're finding throughout more studies and this is obviously through you know, all countries, especially US and UK, that are having massive PTSD problems from you know, 20 plus years of combat. It's not necessarily the combat or having issues with it, but your brain just gets rewired and then it doesn't function. And then obviously everyone treats it, you know, military personnel treat it with substances of some sort. And it goes back to, I think uh, Sarah talks about it in one of hers, it's post-military life, having that direction, having that sense of purpose. And a lot of us, a lot of people just get out and, and don't have that sense of purpose. And all of a sudden everything starts compounding and then it goes from there. I started chasing that adrenaline rush. Yeah, I started jumping out of civvy planes, rock climbing, ridiculous things. I would go chase big waves around everywhere. What I could get to get that adrenaline rush, I didn't consciously know I was doing it. It was subconsciously doing it, pushing myself around. With the benefit of hindsight and obviously the benefit of going to a clinical psychologist, she's pointed all that out. And once you have been in combat, and for me, you know, dropping bombs in close vicinity of, of myself and friendly forces, um, getting shot at, shooting someone back, Nothing repeats that, that adrenaline rush. It is addictive. It is addictive. And it changes the way your brain functions. But you know, there's guys I worked with uh, down at the regiment. They did eight plus rotations to Afghanistan. And that's not even counting the security details. Like they just chased rotation after rotation. I would, and I would have done the same thing if I'd been in their, you know, their category as well. So yeah, so that took its toll. And that's sort of forced my decision uh, to get out. I actually come, once I, come to the realization your military career is over you've, you've had a, a illustrious career i've definitely had the adventures that i first sought and i made a brilliant bunch of friends both uh, in the air force side of things uh, past and present as well as down at two commando regiment like i still catch up with guys that i deployed with for all three rotations that i did to two rotations to afghanistan and a rotation to iraq so yeah, excellent bunch of guys and i'm lucky that way so yeah i was on holidays but official discharge date was the start of this year well you didn't let it really stop you after leaving because you decided to redirect your attention to executive protection yeah yeah so uh, lucky enough again i worked with a couple of guys that i did deployments with picked up a gig executive protection i can't 
obviously talk due to obviously signing non-disclosure agreements. I can't talk about too much about the client, but yeah, very high profile uh, Hollywood couple. And uh, they were over here in Australia. It's funny how the rest of the country is on lockdown for COVID, yet uh, the rich can still fly across the world. But yeah, I did some executive protection uh, for their family and thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, worked with a great bunch of people, both uh, ex sort of tactical police as well as uh, ex special forces and myself. So looking at starting university next year and then also uh, getting on board with a couple of charity organisations. A good friend of mine has set up a charity organisation called uh, Due South at the moment and it's just down in Tasmania. It's about 20, 30 minutes from Cradle Mountain. But he's built a series of houses, I think about six down there and he's got a couple of connexes down there just decked out with uh, mountain bikes, like some climbing gear, some kayaks and stuff like that to put on the water. And it's for emergency responders and military families who just need to get away. So if they can get themselves down there, the accommodation is free. Yeah, so he set up that. He's in talks, I believe, with uh, Jackie Lambie as well um, to get sort of parliamentarian support for it. So, And then I think he's going to link in eventually, or he already started starting to link in with Soldier On and everything like that. So, yeah, that's the direction. I'm going to help him out with that, hopefully. Um, get a few other things kicked off. Uh, Lifeline Australia up in Newcastle. Big shout out to them. They do amazing things up there. So looking at doing one of their crisis cancelling courses there. Yeah, hopefully get involved with a few resilience programs. So that's what I'm looking at. So I've just got to be careful, I suppose, of my own health. I don't take off. It's great to have these ideas when I'm when I'm flying, as I as I call it. But then when I crash, I've just got to take a step back. So uh, that's where my life's heading at the moment. So it gives me that sense of purpose and that direction. Looking back over everything you've done, how do you reflect on your time in the military? Uh, I loved it. It's made me into the person I am today. It's given me the structure that I needed. It's given me that procedural thinking side of things. But it's also given me the ability to rapidly initiate a plan, and I always have a backup plan, which. You know, that's the first thing you sort of learn, especially in combat sort of things. Nothing ever goes the way you plan it. And it's the same with you know, working aircraft. You've got to have that secondary and tertiary plans in place. So I've used that. I've used a lot of my military training just in my day-to-day functionality of life. Troy, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for your service and for sharing your story with us. Thanks very much, Thomas. I'm Thomas Kay, and you've been listening to Life on the Line. We hope you enjoyed that conversation between Thomas Kay and Troy Knight. Troy is currently working on a book due out in 2022. Look him up on Instagram to stay up to date. Troy referenced 2010 action in Afghanistan with H. For more of that story, in Season 4, check out number 54, H Volume 5. But the suffering and the extent of injuries that the remainder of the boys had that lived in that crash, it was just fucking horrific. And our other interview Troy referenced is part of our video documentary series, Life After Service. Watch the episode with Sarah Watson exclusively on our YouTube channel. I think that that sense of purpose can't be underestimated, especially after service. You need to kind of find what drives you and, and gives you purpose to be able to move forward with your life. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram and Facebook at Life on the Line Podcast, on Twitter at L-O-T-L Pod and on LinkedIn at Thistle Productions. And find out more about this show and the team behind it at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhove. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget...